Well, good morning. You know, it's a week ago now that we were all pretty fired up about that hockey game. How many people watched that hockey game? You know, I kind of promised myself it was, as it was happening and everything, I sort of promised myself that I wasn't going to gloat, you know? <laughs> There's no way I'd do some cheap thing and get up in front of the church and just say how happy I was that Canada in your face won. But as the week wore on, I thought, Man, we just don't win that much stuff in Canada, and you've probably moved on to some other victories, so I figured I needed to just take a moment and tell you that we were at least very happy at our house. We're finishing today our verse-by-verse study in 2 Timothy. So why don't you go ahead and open your Bibles to 2 Timothy. And uh, the title of the message this morning, the final message in the series, is Crossing the Finish Line. Crossing the finish line. Actually, the thing about the uh, uh, Olympics that fired me up the most wasn't the hockey game or the uh, figure skating. The thing that I was really fired up from the Olympics was about that Stephen Bradbury guy from Australia. How many people heard that story? That, that was great. And this guy is like in last place in this short track speed skating thing. And what was it happened? The Chinese guy wiped out into the American guy who wiped out into the Korean guy who took out the Canadian guy. They all go sliding into the boards. And this dude who was so far out of the medals, all of a sudden he's like, gold, I won the gold. And he comes cruising across the line in some horrendous time and wins the gold medal. I love that. <laughs> you know what I love about that? I love the fact that that guy didn't give up. And there's times in the race of life where it appears like, you know what, I'm going to be out of the medals. I'm not going to do anything significant. I'm not gonna... But listen, if you keep on going, if you, if you persevere, if you don't give up, you have no idea the victories that you can experience simply by purposing in your heart. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep going. And so the title of the message this morning pulls together all that we've been studying in 2 Timothy, crossing the finish line. That's what we're all about, crossing the finish line. Let's say that together. Say it. Now I'll give you another chance to lift up your voice like you really want this to be true in your life. Go ahead, say it again. That's what we're going after. But you know what? There's obstacles in our way. And I want you to begin to look now with me at 2 Timothy chapter 4. And you're going to see that there's some obstacles that the followers of Christ face as they consider finishing strong. I'm going to come back in a moment for verses 1 through 8. But I want to skip down to verse 9. And I want to show you some of the things that the Apostle Paul was thinking about in the last moments of his life. Remember that he was in that stinking, rat-infested, damp prison in chains, and he didn't know but that any moment he was going to hear footsteps in the hallway and a, a, a key clinking in the door, and he was going to be hauled out and taken off and executed. So these are the final words that the Apostle Paul ever communicated. And in verse 9, we find, I'm going to give you that 1 through 8, that's his final sermon, and it's incredible. But beginning in verse 9, he addresses himself to some personal burdens that were on his heart. And they draw out for us some of the obstacles to perseverance. Notice in verse 9, he says, Make every effort to come to me soon. And Paul is calling for Timothy to come to him in the final moments of his life. Paul loved Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 2, he called Timothy his true child. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, he called him my beloved son. Now listen, if you have ever raced to the bedside of a dying relative, then you understand that the Apostle Paul did not want to die alone. And he wouldn't have been alone, but that he was serving God with his life. And, and that service had taken him very far from his family and those who were familiar to him. He goes on in verse 10 and he says, For Demas, having loved this present world, and by that he doesn't mean having loved, you know, sports cars or Caribbean cruises. He's not talking about worldly things. He's talking about his own life. There was incredible persecution going on of Christians, and Demas loved his life in this world more than his life in the world to come. He was afraid of paying the ultimate price. On one level, we can have compassion on Demas, but he left the apostle Paul alone Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. That's his hometown. And then Crescens, we don't know anything about this guy in the Bible, but apparently Paul and Timothy knew, so it was a letter. It didn't have to be spelled out between them. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus, 
who's mentioned 11 times by Paul, and of course the New Testament book that bears his name, Titus to Dalmatia, whether the second two deserted like Demas, we're not told, but the bottom line was Paul found himself very alone. He says in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Luke, the beloved physician, only Luke is with me. And then he says this amazing thing, pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. You've got to be kidding. Mark? You guys remember about Mark? Mark was the guy in the first missionary journey who was like, man, this is way too hard, and I am so out of here right now. And he quit and went home. When they were getting ready for the second missionary journey, Paul and, and uh, Barnabas were down on the docks packing up the things, and all of a sudden they look over, and Mark's standing there. Like, he's like, they're like, where are you going? And he's like, well, I'm coming with you. And Paul's like, you're not coming with me, man. He's like, why not? Like, you, you quit last time, and I don't want you around anymore. Of course, Barnabas, the encourager, stepped in and said, no, no, we've got to give him another chance. And Paul says, he's not getting another chance. We, we can't do that. And back and forth it went so much so that Paul and Barnabas split up. Paul went with Silas, and Mark joined up with Barnabas. See, the thing I love about this is that later in life, Paul, at the end of his life, is figuring out he was just a man. He's figuring out that some of those things that we make the biggest deal about aren't the biggest deal, right? Maybe you have some relationships, and you made the biggest deal in the world about something, and maybe it wasn't the biggest deal. So Paul says, pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for service. All of those re verses really to say that in the last moments of Paul's life, he was very attuned to people, and he found himself at the end of his life very much alone. Now, isn't it true that when you're alone, and that's a real obstacle to perseverance, and sometimes we feel very alone. Maybe some of you are here this morning and you feel very alone. Maybe you feel like the stand that you've been called to take for Jesus Christ has cost you some relationships. Maybe it's cost you some family. Maybe it's cost you some close friendships. And you're like, man, this perseverance thing is hard. Well, we're not hiding the cost from you. It does involve some loneliness. Here's the second thing that it involves. It involves the loss of comfort. Notice in verse 13. What's the discomfort? He says, when you come, bring the cloak. That's actually a wool uh, garment uh, that, that Paul would wear. And, and what Paul's saying really is, is, is he's, I'm cold, and winter's coming, and he's in this awful place, and he just, he's so uncomfortable, not just physically, but notice that he says, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus. That guy needs a new name. And the books, and especially the parchments. And uh, what books he wanted, we're not really sure. And, and the parchments were what the, actually the New Testament was written on. Very expensive. They were made of the skins of animals. Probably what the Second Timothy was originally written on. We don't have any of the original Bible manuscripts anymore. Not the originals. So the Apostle Paul is calling for these things that, that allow us to be comfortable in life. And that's one of the things that you give up when you decide to follow Christ, isn't it? Some comforts. Maybe you're here this morning and there's some things that you've given up to follow Christ. You think to yourself, man, if I hadn't decided to follow Christ, I'd have that. Maybe you've had to adjust your lifestyle a little bit. Maybe there's some things you're not going to get to do. Maybe there's some places you're never going to go because you give generously to support God's kingdom. And you know other people who are living for this world and they get to do all kinds of things. And you're like, well, well but, but I, I, I'm not doing those things because I'm living for Christ. And there's a price that's being paid for perseverance, isn't there? There's obstacles to be overcome, loneliness, discomfort. Look at the next one, conflict. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. That Alexander, we're not sure if that's the one he talked about in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 20. That was the guy that had to be turned over to Satan so that he would learn not to blaspheme. But he adds the words, the coppersmith, so there was a lot of Alexanders around in those days. It's kind of like Dave's. How many Dave's here this morning? Put up your hand if your name's Dave. Hey, Dave's. Lots of Dave's around. How many Jim's or James? You know, lots of those guys around. Okay, same thing. And Alexander. So the fact that he puts Alexander the coppersmith might indicate that this was a different one. Either way, look, notice what he did. He did me much harm. The Lord will repay. He did me... How would you like to be the guy who shows up in eternity? What would you do with your life? Well, I did the Apostle Paul much harm. <laughs> you what? What were you thinking? How could you have resisted him? Well, he did. And notice that Paul doesn't take the vengeance into his own hands. Paul says the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. 
Thessalonians, in Thessalonians, we learn that it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. And Paul just turned him over to the Lord. The guy that resisted Paul, he just said, you know what, God, you take care of him. And I'm sure God did. He can handle that. But don't notice the warning that comes with it, the conflict of people when you're in ministry. Be on guard against him yourself, Timothy. Watch out for this Alexander the coppersmith. If he shows up, be on guard, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. It's been interesting to note over the years that those very few people who have strongly opposed the ministry of harvest have gone on other places to do the same thing to others. It's not the personal thing that they want to make it. It's something else entirely. And those who, I'm not talking about little disagreements, but those who vigorously oppose the truth of God's word make it a pattern and go on to do it other places. That's why Paul warned Timothy. And so he's in conflict. Everybody doesn't think Paul's the greatest guy in the world. Jesus himself said, beware when all men speak well of you. And one of the things that comes from a commitment to persevering with your life is there's going to be some conflict. There's going to be some people you're not going to get along with that great. Notice this last obstacle to perseverance, rejection. At my defense, verse 16, at my defense, at my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. That phrase, at my first defense, actually there were two defenses. The first one was where the, the um, accusations were made and the, the uh, initial defenses were made and the whole case was laid out and the witnesses were called. And then at the second one, the final arguments and ultimately the verdict. And Paul says, I made my first defense. Can you imagine this? No one supported me. There's a guy whose life had touched hundreds or thousands of people, and how many people were there at the end to really stand for Paul and witness to his character and integrity? Can you imagine how lonely and deserted and rejected he felt? All deserted me. And then he prays the same thing Jesus prayed on the cross, the same thing Stephen prayed when he was being stoned. A gracious response of a Christian under the sovereignty of God, may it not be counted against them. You lay all these things out together and you begin to understand that there are some serious obstacles to perseverance, to finishing strong, to crossing the finish line. And so I want to go back now uh, to uh, chapter 4, verse 1. I want to share with you five keys to crossing the finish line. Because if crossing the finish line was easy, everybody would be doing it, right? And I'm here to tell you, sad but true statistics say that a lot of you people here, you're not going to make it to the finish line. I wish it weren't true. Maybe I'm not going to make it. The scripture says, let him who stands take heed lest he fall. Do you think you're going to make it? I had the privilege last week of meeting Steve Farrar. If you've ever, he's a men's speaker and he's written a couple of really neat books. One of them uh, is Finishing Strong. Another one, Anchor Men. And I had never met him before. I was kind of excited to meet him. And in the beginning of his book, Finishing Strong, uh, he tells uh, the story of his pastor from First Baptist Church in Houston, a man named John Bassanio, who for many years had served, uh, has served in that church, 30 uh, plus years, pastor of one church. I love that picture. Well, when he was just starting out in ministry, he went to his father-in-law. They were talking about ministry, and his father-in-law was challenging him, John, do you have what it takes to finish what you start? And they were discussing this, and he shared with them this. He said, you know, I've ex observed that only one in ten people who sets out in ministry actually makes it to the finish line and does for their lifetime what they committed to do, only one in ten. John was like, no way. His father-in-law was like, way. So he went and wrote down the actual names and he kept track of it over 30 years. And sadly, he found of the 53 names, I think, that he wrote down, when he got to the end of it, only three of them were still faithfully serving the Lord and hadn't through moral things or through discouragement or through finances or through some way disqualified themselves or just given up and quit. I remember when I read that, I thought that was kind of crazy. So I went back to my yearbook where Pastor Rick and I went to Bible college and I circled our 25 best friends, including he and I, and now only 18 years out of that graduation date, half of them are not serving the Lord anymore. And these are people who say that they're called to full-time ministry. What about all of us here? Are we going to make it to the finish line? And we've purposed. You say, well, how can I make it? Well, I want to lay these things out for you right now. And this is the remainder of our time. 
five keys to crossing the finish line. The first one, notice what it says in verse 5, fulfill your ministry. Well, I want to go back at verse 1 and just see what that ministry exactly is. Look at 2 Timothy 4 verse 1. He says, I solemnly charge you. We've studied that before, haven't we? Solemnly charge means fervently urge, emphatically warn. And then he's like, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God. And what's that saying? What's the difference between solemnly charging a person and solemnly charging a person in the presence of God? What he's saying is, is dude, you better listen up because God's listening right now, so you better be listening because he's listening. And then he turns the screws even further. Look at verse 1. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus it says, who is to judge the living and the dead. In other words, you're going to hear this again. This solemn charge I'm about to give you, you're going to hear it again. And the next time you hear it, you're not going to have any chance to like redo Okay, this is your opportunity to obey the things that I'm about to teach you. And when you get to hear about this again, you're going to be across the finish line. And all we're going to be doing then is Jesus Christ is going to be standing up. He's going to be reading the record of what you did with what I'm about to tell you. Like, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom. I, I, I still don't know why that's there. I think he's just turning the screws more, you know, like pounding the nail, like, do I have your full attention, please? Could I have your full attention, please? Okay, he's, he's like, have I got your full attention? Because what I'm about to tell you is really important. Okay, if I got it? If I've got it, say got it. got it. Got it. I solemnly charge you. Say, charge me what? Here's the first thing. Preach the word. Preach the word. It's an interesting Greek text. It's all, or five imperatives here to follow. Preach the word is the first one. And I won't give you a Greek tense lesson this morning if I was even capable, only to say this. Uh, that what it's really saying is, is all five of these things, preach the word, be ready, and all that follows, do it now. Get this stuff to the top of your list. Do it now and keep on doing it. Do what? Well, preach the word. Actually, they're keruso. It means to herald, to publicly proclaim. It, it's actually used 112 times in Scripture. It means to announce. This is the method that Jesus used. This is the method that the apostles used. This is the means of spreading the good news in the early church. And it's not just for a few. It's for everyone. One of the things that bugs me about the word preach is, is I know that as soon as you hear it, you think preacher. Wrong. Just think of proclaim. Just think of announce. All of the people of God are called. This is our job. And if you want to make it to the finish line, one of the things you've got to have going on is you've got to be doing your job. And this is our job, to herald the truth of God's word, to preach. It is the means by which the world is converted. Mark 16, 15, Jesus said, go into all the world and what? Preach the gospel. It is the very channel through which our faith comes to us. Romans 10, 13 says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how can they believe in him of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? Somebody to tell them. Do you know how many people today would receive Christ if someone would just what? Tell them. That's why we need preachers. It is the thing the world describes, despises the most. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.18, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. <laughs> but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the compelling call upon the man of God. 1 Corinthians 9.16, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Now that's a quick survey of the word preach just in the New Testament. And so many other examples could be given. But understand this, it's not just the responsibility of the pastor to preach. It's the responsibility of every follower of Christ. Now I'm solemnly charging you about this. So you're not going to be able to show up in heaven someday and say, well, I didn't even know we were supposed to be doing that. And Jesus is going to be like, well, your old pastor told you that. He solemnly charged you, preach the word. I'll do it on Sundays, all right? And then all of us got to do it in between every day, announcing the good news of Jesus Christ to anyone who will listen. 
And notice how the text goes on because he's told us specifically now the method is preach. That's a method. Some people are having a hard time with that method today. But that is the method. And what's the message of preaching? Tell me. No, no, spoon feed me. No, no, tell me. What's the message? Preach what? Look at, look at the text. Preach what? Preach the word. You say, well, James, that's so obvious. Of course you'd preach the word. But some people are having a really hard time with that these days. And pastors are standing up in their churches and reviewing magazine articles and, and, and talking about books. God wrote a book, though. So I think that's the one we should focus on. Uh, preach the word. Instead of giving little subtle talks to woo people and help God, I'm sure he really appreciates that leg up. What, what we should do is we should just preach the word. Proclaim God's truth. That's the biblical methodology for ministry. And then notice this. Look at verse 2. Be ready. Be ready in season and out of season. That word ready there reminds me of my basketball coach when I was little. One of the first things I learned in basketball was the ready stance, they called it. You gotta be on the balls of your feet. You know what I'm talking about? You gotta be leaning forward. You gotta have your hands ready. You gotta be able to go like this or go like this or go like this whenever you need to. And God's people need to be ready like that with the word of God. To be ready all the time. Notice it says in season and out of season. That means when it's popular, and when it's not, when it's convenient, and when it's not, all the time, in season and out of season. Now we understand from studying 2 Timothy, we know what the job is, preach, we know when we're supposed to do it, all the time. Now he gives three hows. You see them there in the text? Reprove, rebuke, exhort. The word reprove there means to convict, to show a person what they did wrong. Proverbs 9, 8 says, reprove a wise man and he will love you for it. If there's anything I've learned as a pastor, you can tell a lot about a person's heart when you reprove them. When you bring the word of God to bear upon a person's life, if they're wise, they'll love you for it. But if they're foolish, they'll hate you for it. Nevertheless, Preach the word. Reprove. What's the next word? Rebuke. That's a different thing. That's a sharp, straight. It's the same word that was used of Christ in the Gospel of Luke when he stood up and stilled the storm. And the original means literally, knock it off. And rebuke is a strong, sharp word. Sometimes that's what's needed. Reprove, rebuke, and then what? Exhort, exhort. Some of your translations say encourage. Both of those are good. It's the idea that after the reproof and the rebuke has been given, if the heart is tender, then you come along with the support and you're like, come on, come on, we can do this. And the encouragement comes in when the heart has been tilled by the reproof and by the rebuke. And how are we to do this? Reprove, rebuke, exhort, what's it say? With great patience and instruction. Reprove and rebuke are for the will. Get with it. And the exhortation or encouragement part is for the emotions. Come on, you can do it. And the patient instruction is for the mind. Do you understand? Is it clear? Let's go over it again. This is what we're supposed to be about. Now all of those things are to characterize the proclamation of the word. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Why? Why? Well, not just for the people's sake, but for the time's sake. Look at verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Hey, newsflash, not the time will come. Just write in the margin of your Bible, is here. The time is here when they will not endure sound doctrine. The word sound doctrine there means healthy, life-giving truth. And as one person who spends a lot of time communicating God's word, I want to bring to you this morning a word of encouragement because I have increasing the privilege of teaching God's word in a lot of places. 
And I can tell you there is not a place, and I hear this from the guest uh, ministers who come here too. There's not a place that I go where, where the people are more hungry and attentive. And, you know, so many times now pastors are preaching for 16, 17 minutes, 19 minutes, once a week. And you guys sit here every week, 45 plus minutes with the word of God open and a pen in your hand and taking notes and listening. And you are to be encouraged in a day when people will not endure sound doctrine that you're willing to sit under the patient instruction of God's word and to follow along and to pay attention because it matters. It really matters. The time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. Do you know what I'm talking about? Just a little more over here, right? Yeah, right behind the ear. That's perfect. Thanks. Yeah, right there. Oh, that feels so good when people just scratch me right there. And so much of the body of Christ is clamoring about. Some of your uh, translations have itching ears. Itching ears, itching ears that always want to hear something new, something different, something immediately gratifying. A little emotional high, please. A funny story, a poem at the end. Move me, shed a tear. A quick fix. Kind of the fast food church, if you know what I mean. It's not helping anybody. How many people here have ever had poison ivy? Ever had poison ivy? Oh, is that the brutal thing or what? One time when I was in college, a friend of mine were out playing behind my grandmother's house and just kind of goofing around and running through the woods and holy smokes, playing in the poison ivy. And I had it like from my knees down to my feet so that I would just sit and scratch it. And I mean, it would run down into a pool around my feet on the kitchen floor. I could still see it while I'm talking about it. And I'm talking like itchy. funny because when I say that I see a lot of you guys kind of go <laughs> <laughs> but what about itching ears and so many in the church today they're itching itching oh isn't that a new thing oh isn't that a clever thought oh that was so interesting oh you've got to hear this tape oh you've got to whatever but it's not sound doctrine it's not the meat of God's word it's not the truth that you can build your life on and you're hungry 15 minutes later it's not nourishing your soul. And that's why the people of God are called one to another, the leaders of the church, to the people of God, to preach the word. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. Whole churches built on this. Whole denominations built on this. Tell us what we want to hear and I often hear people say, man, there's nobody preaching the word anymore. But listen, listen, it's not just the preacher's fault, it's the people's fault. And as long as there are people who want a certain message, there will be men who rise up to give them exactly what they want. And yes, there's a responsibility on the ministers, but there's a responsibility on the people too. I've tried to communicate to you so many times that this precious thing that God is growing up in between us is a two-way thing. It's a willingness to speak, but it's a willingness to hear and to receive the truth of God's word. Instead, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. What I want, what I want, who I don't like that, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. Circle that word myths, because where people have itching ears, there will always be myths propagated in the church. Make a note of these four popular myths attacking the church today. And I want to just take a moment because I want to grow in you a capacity to discern. Let's look up here for a second. Some of these things you might be aware of, some of them you might not be aware of at all, but these are trends in the church today, messages that are emerging that are not biblical, that are crafted. These messages are crafted for itching ears. Here's one that the word of God is not sufficient, that the word of God uh, does not have all of the answers that people need for the complex problems of 21st century man. And instead of uh, the message of the word of God, we're told that what we need now is, is, is to get psychology. And the word psychology means literally the study of the soul. Well, it just so happens that Almighty God has already written a book on the soul. 
And any contributions from psychology, however small, have not seriously upgraded what God calls all things pertaining to life and godliness. I want you to hear it from me this morning. If you have a problem, we all have problems. If you have a burden, if you have an issue in your life, if you have a struggle, something that you're facing, the answer is not found by running away from God's word and getting some counselor and going to him for six years and month after month and he just listens to you. Listen, we are all in favor of going for counseling. If you need counsel, if you need help, come to our pastors. Let us refer you to someone that can help you. But listen, to go to a counselor who never opens the word of God who, who never prays with you, who, who's not ministering in the power of God's spirit. I'll tell you this, if the answer to your problem doesn't leave you closer to God, it wasn't God's answer for you. And you can find all kind of worldly answers, and I don't judge those people who don't know the Lord for doing the best that they can. What I struggle with is the people of God running off and clamoring for the world to solve the very things that God in his word and in the power of his Holy Spirit wants to give to you. That's the first one that is so prevalent in the church today. Oh, the word, it's not sufficient. Wrong. I know what some of you say, though. They say, well, I've been to your counselors, Pastor James, and they, man, they're just like straight to the point. Yeah, right. What would you want? You go to the doctor. Do you want the doctor to tell you you've got a terminal disease three years from now? No, no, you say, well, I want to know now. Right. And when you get with someone who's committed to sharing the word of God and the power of the spirit, you don't have to go to the guy for six months to figure out what's going on. They're not going to waste your money and, and live off of your problems. They're going to help you and they're going to get right to the issue. You say, well, it was too direct. I don't like it. Itching ears. You've got itching ears. You want to find people who will tell you what you want to hear instead of compassionately and directly take you to the source of the issue. God help us to love the truth and pursue the truth to the answers, the things we're facing. Here's a second thing. People say, well, the word of God's not sophisticated. If you really want to reach people, if you really want to reach baby boomers and Gen Xers and postmoderns and whatever. We logged onto some websites this week and found the sad things that churches are writing in their attempts to reach people. Here's one church in the Northwest United States, way out on the, I think, Seattle area. Here's what they post on their website. Our church is growing large and strong with an emphasis on the importance of every individual. Itching ears, how sad. Here's a church from Detroit. Our, ch our church is not just a church, it's an adventure. <laughs> Ooh. We're going on a safari, are we? Here's a church from out on the West Coast. We'll make sure the first face you see when you approach our church has a smile on it. Well, if by that you mean friendliness, that's wonderful, but I'm kind of surprised that you would post that as the main emphasis of your church. And then this was very sad, also a church on the West Coast. These are some of the biggest churches in the country. If I told you the names, you'd recognize some of them. Here's what they say. We will give you the resources and the opportunity to reflect upon yourself, to develop a balanced lifestyle and discover the healthy, whole person God designed you to be. That is a myth. That is not the answer to anyone's problems. Now, to give a positive example, here's a church that's uh, proclaiming the gospel in a very difficult place, First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. Now, listen to what they say about their ministry. I thought this was phenomenal. They say, a people who desire to know Christ and to raise the cross over Hollywood. Now, how great is that? And do you see the difference? Do you see the stirring? As soon as you hear that in your heart, you're like, yeah, that is right, you know? And, and, but the myths that are out there in the church today, tragically posing as the ministry of Christ, they say the word's not sufficient, the word's not sophisticated. We're studying myths here. Two more quickly. Some say the word is not settled. Some suggest that the word of God is still emerging, that it's still being, it's changing. The message of it's changing. My brother wrote me an email this week. The church that he was uh, attending is attempting to adjust the biblical teaching on the role of women. And I don't want to get into all that this morning except to say this. 
the rationale that they give for explaining away the clear teaching of Scripture, the rationale that they give is they say, well, some people take a static approach to God's Word, but we take a redemptive approach. My brother was like, well, what do you mean by that? And, well, some people believe that the Bible always means the same thing through all the centuries. We believe that the Bible means different things to different people. And now in our age, it used to mean that, but now in our modern, more sophisticated culture, now it means this. As soon as I hear that, I just want to throw so bad. Do you know how off track that is? Let me just tell you. And that's coming big time. Get ready to hear that from your family and friends. The redemptive approach to studying the Bible. Do you know how many, and I don't care that much about the role of women. I don't think that's a huge issue. It's not a big issue in our church, and I celebrate women leaders coming forward. There are very few things that God does not provide for women to do in the church, only a few restrictions. But I'll tell you what concerns me about it is not that issue. It's all the perversities in society that are standing in line behind that somewhat innocent issue and are waiting to say, oh, beautiful, so now... We have to interpret the Bible in terms of the modern man. And, and all kinds of people want to say, well, that used to be sin back then, but that's not sin now because, because, because. This idea that the word of God is not settled when it is. And then a last myth. Again, notice it says in verse 4, they will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. This idea that the word of God is not sure that is not reliable. Many examples of this could be given in our day, but I think the place where this is most apparent is in the matter of the uniqueness of Christ. And many are teaching today that Christ is not unique and that his unique message is to be rejected in a world of pluralism. Uh, Dr. Stoll was recently, I heard him tell this story in Nashville and he said I could share it here. He was recently attending uh, the Chicago Leadership Prayer Breakfast. He says it's one of those things you have to go to. And, and so the Chicago Leadership Prayer Breakfast had every faith, every denomination, every Muslim and Buddhist and Christian and every, everything there. And of course, the thing he said I've noticed over the years is less and less and less, lots of God, no Jesus, no Jesus. In fact, someone else shared with me this week, did you know that program on television, Touched by an Angel? I think there's probably some good people that are behind that program, but you know that the networks have said, I was, rep was reported to me, that the networks have said there's only two words that can never be used on that program. I mean, they're told, Jesus Christ, never to be spoken on that program. And yet all kinds of talk of God and spirituality, and Dr. Stoll says, I was sitting there listening as the Muslim and, and the Buddhist and the apostate liberal Christian person and the Jewish person all stood up and chanted this prayer, taking turns to this generic God. He said, the person really that I had come to hear was the rector of Trinity Church in Wall Street in New York. He was being introduced as having been deeply involved in the problems of ministry surrounding Ground Zero after 9-1-1. He said, I wasn't disappointed by his communication skills. He was charming and witty. But as the message progressed, he put into words what I'd begun to fear about post-911 America. He rejoiced in the fact that after 911, a whole new sense of importance of God had returned to America. But what is different, he claimed, is that given the broad diversity of America, we all now need, listen, to give up the traditions that bring disunity among those of us who believe in God. Give up the traditions that bring disunity. He then quoted Carl Sandburg, who reportedly said, the worst word in the English language is exclusive. Dr. Stoll writes, as the preacher continued, it became increasingly apparent that the tradition he was asking me to give up to achieve this celebrated unity was Jesus. If I would just be willingly not to speak in his name or to publicly articulate his exclusive claims to deity and redemption, we could get along just fine in celebrating the plurality of gods. If I would be willing to strip Christ of his rightful claims to singular preeminence among other gods and re-engineer re him so that he could get along with other gods, everything would be just fine. And as the rector concluded his remarks, I remember thinking to myself, he says, I hope there's not gonna be a, a standing ovation for this guy. And he was like, no sooner had I thought that than he closed and the people broke out in thunderous applause and rose to their feet. 
And having heard the message that he preached, he said, I realized that for me to stand, and you know Dr. Stoll, man, he's a cheerleader. And if there's anything even slightly acceptable in you, he's cheering it on. He said, I realized that I couldn't stand and I couldn't applaud. And I sat there at one of the front tables while everyone around me stood and thunderously applauded and sat with my hands in my lap and my head bowed and refused to identify with a message that would marginalize my Savior and reduce him to the sideline in a world that doesn't care about truth but only this sort of uh, negotiated, manufactured, false unity. I would just tell you in our church this morning, our world has changed. We live in a day now where the name that is not welcome is the name that is above every name. And as the God of this age heightens his attack upon this world in these last days, the dividing lines are becoming incredibly clear. And I believe with all of my heart that in the days to come, to cross that finish line, it's going to cost us more than it has ever costed us before. And it's going to cost us relationships. And when we continue to proclaim, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And we trumpet the message of Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Those who do not have the Spirit of God within them, the Scripture says we are the aroma of death to those who are perishing. And if, as we anticipate what it means to persevere, we need to hear this charge. Fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry as others turn aside to these myths. Look at verse 5. But you, but you, don't you love that? Other people are going to be cashing in. Other people are going to be turning away. But you, but you, you're not going to be doing that. No. But you, be sober in all things. Be sober. Now, you know I like to laugh, right? I always like to have a good time and just yuck it up with my friends. Nothing I love more than that. But you know, I'm convinced that increasingly upon the people of God, there's going to be a seriousness. And there, this is a serious day. And this, there, there, there's a, a sobering opportunity that is before us but you be sober in all things. Endure hardship. And how clear could that be? Going through some hard times? I won't have you put your hand up, but how many people are going through some hard times? You're going through some hard times? Endure. You say, but it's getting really hard. Endure. You say, well, I don't know if I can make it. You can make it. Just take one step at a time. You say, well, I'm trying to decide where I'm going to go. You're going to go ahead. Uh, but I don't know if I can make it. You can Endure hardship. What a wonderful call to the Lord's people. Endure hardship, and then I like this. Do the work of an evangelist. See, Timothy didn't have the gift of evangelism. Some of you don't have the gift of evangelism. I don't have the gift of evangelism. That's not my primary gift. And for some of us, how many people find evangelism? That's kind of hard work for me. I'm more of an encourager. I'm more of a helper. Evangelism, that's, not, that's, evangel, that's hard work. He's like, do it. Do the work of an evangelist. It's going to be hard work for you, but it's work that must be done. Do the work of an evangelist. There's the final summary statement. Fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. Get it done. And if you could line 100 Christians up in front of me, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm putting my money on the Christians that are serving God. Those consumer Christians who are just coming to church, singing a few songs, and you know, having their own thing with God, I don't got a lot of confidence that you're going to make it. But the workers, man, the roll up their sleeves, get busy for God, people, that's, that's where it's at. And that's the first key to perseverance. The others will come much more quickly because there's only a little bit of Scripture around them. I kind of pace my message out by how much Scripture there is. Look at the next verse. This is the second thing. Fulfill your ministry. Second thing, fight. Tough times will come. Notice he says that in verse 7, I have fought the good fight. But before that, he says in verse 6, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. That concept, drink offering, Exodus 29, 40, Leviticus 23, 13, it's a ceremony of worship to God. Paul says, I'm like that ceremony of worship. And they would take a drink, and they would hold it up to God, like wine usually, and they would just pour it out before God like this. 
It was like just giving everything over to God, just giving it up to him. And Paul said, my life's like that. I'm just being poured out before God, just totally offered, totally spilt and poured out for him. The time of my departure is at hand. And then he says this great phrase, I love it. I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. The picture there is of struggling against an opponent, of wrestling. And sometimes it is a real fight, isn't it? Truth be told, sometimes it is a real fight to be faithful and to persevere. That's all right. That's what God has laid out for us. Tough times will come. And I like the honesty of God's word because there's nothing worse than getting surprised, don't you think? My parents used to tell me that all the time when they were trying to train me. They're like, you know what? We're fine with everything. No surprises. You know? And there doesn't need to be any surprises here. We're going to have to go through tough times. There will be some fighting. Here's a third thing. Finish. I wrote down, without this, nothing matters. What, do you, what, do you, what are you going to have if you don't finish? I have finished the course. The course there is the picture of a, literally of a racetrack, the final lap, closing in on the tape, pressing and leaning. And then the word finish. I have finished the course. The same word that Jesus used on the cross, John 19, 30. It is what? It's finished. Wow, we're in good company. Jesus Christ, the apostle Paul. I want to finish, man. Without that, nothing matters. Do you know that the greatest shame of human existence is things we start but we don't finish them? You know what I'm talking about? If you have any stuff like that, stuff you started but you never finished it, don't you just feel bad about that? You know, I never ever said this publicly until last night in the service, but I didn't finish high school. I had one class that I was supposed to take, and it, it, I didn't, you know, fail it or anything. I just never got it. And uh, High school's a little different in Canada. There's an extra year of it, and it's a long story, and they go for five years of high school in Ontario. It's a long story, but the bottom line is, is what I started, I didn't finish it. But because I had four years of high school, I was able to go to college, and I went to college and graduated from college and became a youth pastor and moved to another city, always nagging in the back of my mind, I didn't finish it. I didn't finish it. So six years after I finished high school, two years after I got married and graduated from college, I went back to high school. And, and, and I went to this night school, and all these kids, it seemed at the time, looking back, I was one still. And I went and took this course for a whole winter. Why? Because every time I thought about that thing I started and I didn't finish, I felt so bad about it. And when it was done, it was like this thing off my back. You know what I'm talking about? And I really believe that when we get to the end of our life, the things that are going to grieve us most are the things that we started and we didn't finish them. You know what I'm talking about? When we give up, when we give up on our marriage, when we give up on our kids, when we give up on each other, when we give up on God, those are the things at the end of the life that we are going to be the most grieved about. The most shame. Now, without finishing, nothing else really matters. I want to be like the Apostle Paul. I want to be able to say, I have finished the course, and then notice this in the text, I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. What an important principle to learn. What does he mean? Well, I kept it from being distorted or polluted. I kept it going. I've spread the word. I've spread the faith. I think he means, though, I kept it personally. I made it. I finished. I kept the faith. Faith, remember? Believing the word of God, acting upon it, no matter how I feel, because God promises a good result. I've kept the faith. I did it all the way to the finish line. What a great goal. And notice this in verse 17 and 18. I'm nearly done. Let me just read these to you. He says, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. See, that's the source of Paul's strength. That's how he kept the faith. The Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished and that all the Gentiles might hear. That was the call that was placed on his life, and he got it done. He said, I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. That's a reference to Caesar. God kept him alive long enough to get the job done. But now in verse 18, he has a different rescue in mind. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Fulfill your ministry. Fight the good fight. Finish the course. Keep the faith. Here's the last thing. Future. Do you see that in verse 8? Eyes on the prize. This is the verse that we chose as a theme verse for the whole passage. He says in verse 8, 
In the future, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness. See, Paul had his eyes on the goal. That's how he persevered. That's the final key, thinking about the future. Not thinking about today, thinking about the future. And notice what it says in the text. You should make a note of this. In the future, there is laid up for me. Just think of it. Just think of it. There's already in heaven, as a follower of Christ, there's already there a crown. Think of it, Roy. There's a crown there already, and it's got your name on it. It's laid up for you. So it's not going to be Carol's crown. Or a different shelf. It's down the aisle and around the corner. It's just filed perfectly. They totally have their act together in heaven and all that inventory stuff. And there's a crown. Notice what this text says. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Someday the Lord's going to pick that crown off the shelf and just shine it up perfectly and bring it over and place it upon your head. And I want to be there to celebrate that. Faithfulness, finishing strong. So many people defecting and quitting in the final lap. A future laid up for me, laid up for me, laid up for me. Everyone say for me. Your crown, baby, it's there. Are you going to get it? Are you going to get it? Laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, see, righteous, he doesn't give it any dumb awards. Nobody gets one by mistake. There's, there's nobody like, what's he get a crown for? No, everyone that gets one deserves one. Everyone that doesn't deserve one won't get it. The crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on, there's that day again. Seems like we're always talking about that day, aren't we? Man, I can't wait for that day. Award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Let's take a moment and bow together in prayer. Father, thank you this morning for your word. And thank you for this study that we've done on 2 Timothy, how clearly it lays out the path before us. And Lord, not a person in this room knows how long the path in front of them is. Do we have days? Do we have weeks or months? Do we have years? We don't know, but you know. And this morning, Lord, by faith, we ask you for the strength to finish what we have begun, to be faithful to you. Oh God, February, March, 2002, 2 Timothy, the time that I purposed in my heart that I was going to finish what I began. May it be true, God. No matter what we face, Lord, I know there's some people here this morning that are facing great economic uncertainties, uncertain about their job, and Lord, give to them in this moment an assurance of your full provision for them in your time and in your way. May the peacefulness in their heart reflect the reality of your presence with them. Lord, I know that there are others who are really hurting in their families in a variety of ways, in their marriage and with their children, and it's not been easy. And persevering for you has meant bringing some conflict. But I pray, oh God, this morning, though maybe they can't see even how they'll persevere another week, that they would just set their mind to that, one step at a time, one lap at a time, in your strength to finish this job, to fulfill our ministry, to fight the good fight, to keep our eyes on that day, that future day. Lord, even in this moment, it is speeding upon us more so that we can realize in a very few moments the vapor of our life will have gone. Cause us to be faithful to you. Give us strength to do that. Give us purposefulness. We recommit ourselves to that goal. These things we pray, Lord Jesus, in your strong and precious name. Amen. Amen? Amen. I told the uh, worship team I wanted to have a fired up song at the end of this series because this has been kind of intense at times, hasn't it? So I told them we're going to have a fired up song and they said they got one. We've been looking forward to it. So I think you're going to want to stand.
Right, Harvest, let's put our hands together. There you go. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Now there is before me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all that have longed for his appearing. Sing it. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Now there is before me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all that have longed for his appearance. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have fought the fight. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Amen. Well, see, I, I knew that Dan had a lot of soul. I knew that. The person that I'm kind of surprised about is Johanna. And Johanna works at our church, and she's a sweet one, but she, she, she's got a lot of soul there, doesn't she? I've heard this in three services now. I just need a little bit more, and then I'll be done with it, all right? So let's hear a little more, and then I'm going to close. One, two, three. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. Yes, Lord. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 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 Amen. Amen. You know, I love to sing that, and I hope you'll just be singing that and asking the Lord to keep that out in front of you all the time. That's the goal of every Christian. Man, starting's easy. People are starting every day. Starting is nothing to keep going, to keep going, to keep going and following the Lord. That's what he's called us to, to finish strong. So I trust the Lord will seal uh, to our hearts by his spirit of his teaching from 2 Timothy. And the enemy won't snatch away the seed that's been sown there but that we'll understand like we never have before what it means to persevere for the Lord. As always, we're here to pray for you and to minister to you. We would consider that a great joy. You are loved. Have a great week.